Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's Wednesday community lunch here at the Divinity School. Sorry. I'm Jen Moss. I'm the director of communications here and the organizer of this series. And I wasn't here last week, so it's my pleasure to welcome you now to the spring quarter of Wednesday lunch. And it's lovely to see you all here today. So before we get started, I want to do our usual housekeeping. Our head chef for today is Casey. So we do ask that you bust your own stations. If you could put your, uh, are these, okay, come closer now. These plates? Yeah, yeah, kind of. Some are and some are. <laughs> the bulls are. The bulls are. If you could make your best decision about <laughs> to compost your favorite products on your way out and put your food leftovers into the compost, that would be great. And your silver into our soapy vat. Uh, that helps us out. If you clean up after yourselves, thank you. Are there any community announcements today? Um, events coming up, Dean Owen? Or no, you can swear. Did you have an announcement? Yes. <laughs> if you're applying for the Martin Marty Center Junior Dissertation Fellowships for a PhD student, this bit of a candidacy, um, today is the deadline. She's <laughs> better than that. Anybody else? Announcement? No? Okay. Well, I'll have an um, Next week, um, our guest is, well, it's birthday next Wednesday. So our guest for next Wednesday is, Ol oh, I'm sorry, Olatunji Oboy Reed, who is the co-founder and president of Slow Roll Chicago. Slow Roll is like a national movement about bicycling and bringing the transformative power of bicycling to communities. So he's our um, special birthday Wednesday lunch guest, and I hope that many of you can come to hear him. Today's guests, however, are all right here, they're sitting in front of me. Um, I'm really delighted to be able to announce, or sorry, to introduce our guest for today, who are members of Gender Just. Is this your actual subtitle or is this the title of the time? Speaking on <laughs> politics outside the mainstream. Gender Just is a multiracial, multi-generational collective with a diversity of marginalized gender and sexual identities, skills, cultures, abilities, citizenship, status, educational backgrounds, and income levels. Um, they brought three representatives here today to talk about their work. We have our panel is uh, Julian Hendricks, Yasmin Nair, 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 the first time. Yes, thank you. And Lucky Mosquito. Mosquito. Mm -hmm. yeah. And mm -hmm. practice that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So please uh, join me in welcoming Jennifer today. Thank you. Thank you. Also, you can just turn off your ringers or buzzers. That would be great. Oh, I think you can stay seated. If you can't hear us, because I know sometimes it's annoying to be in a room where you can only hear the voice but not see the people. So if you'd rather we stand up, please let us know. What do you think? And this is Carrie. Is this cool? Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, my knee, thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you. Uh, what do you thank you, everyone, for coming here first of all and on this gorgeous spring day when you could be outside. Thank you for the fantastic meal. Thank you, Sharon and school, the school for inviting us here. We're delighted to be here. A lot of what we do is to interact with, uh, you know, taking all the pictures of community into consideration. But what we do is to interact with community on a regular basis. So this is this is a real joy and pleasure for us to be here. Uh, what we're going to do is, for about five minutes, we're just going to quickly introduce um, ourselves, why, what drew us to Gender Judge, who we are, etc. But that's five minutes, all three of us together. For about 10 minutes, I'm going to be talking about uh, gender just history, um, you know, who we are, what we do, and so on. And then Julian is going to talk about a rather a pivotal part, a critical part of our of who we are, which is uh, in terms of the nonprofit industrial complex and how we are not that and what it means to be a grassroots organization. He's going to focus on one particular uh, campaign, I'm going to focus on another one. Uh, and Lucky will be here, is here to fill us in because Lucky is actually one of our oldest, in terms of uh, longest standing 
members of gender justice and has an institutional memory that a lot of us don't have. So uh, I'll go ahead and start. My name is Yasmin Naya. I've been a long time Chicago resident. I've been part of gender justice since about 2009 or so. I actually began, I actually first heard about gender justice when I sent a report on it by the City Times, a local gay paper. Um, and I was intrigued because it was, and I'll discuss this a little bit more, but what I found fascinating about it was that it was the only queer organization in town, and really one of the few in the country, and the world, the universe, uh, which actually had a critique of neoliberalism and was an LGBTQ organization, a queer organization, as I prefer to call it. Uh, and how, you know, what I mean by that, I'll explain further, but I was deeply drawn to gender justice, and of course, yes, uh, uh, you can be assured that I stopped reporting on it because the conflict of interest and so on and so forth. Just to put that out there. <laughs> uh, my name is Julian Hendricks. Um, somebody asked me what I do, and I said, I need to get a business card because I'm a man about town. I do many things. <laughs> um, I've been, I, I sell groceries to some of you, probably. Uh, I have been a member of Gender Just formally for a little over a year. Um, and had been aware of it doing various things um, in the past. Um, what interested me about gender justice is I was interested in being involved in a uh, queer group, um, but I was also, um, what I like about gender justice is we are very interested in complexity of issues. So not just working on um, anti-racism work, not just working on labor issues, but thinking from a queer perspective in terms of how um, sexual minorities, gender uh, identity minorities are shaped by various factors, but also recognizing that depending on who you are and what's going on, um, different factors may come to play and to have a flexibility around identifying what, um, what needs to move um, to um, improve our entire community. So that's what interests me. Uh, good afternoon, um, my name is Lucky Mosqueda, and I'm actually a born and bred Chicagoan. I'm born in Oakland, but I live in the North State now, so I'll probably be moving in probably this summer. So. Um, I uh, joined Gender Just um, in 2009, so as Yasmin stated, I'm like one of the original members. So I um, actually joined when I was 21, and um, Excuse me if I pause because I have a multitude of disabilities and my speech is kind of affected. So, um, yeah, and speaking of, like, I was really curious about um, to see if there were any queer groups that would um, that focus on more intersectionality, not just on race, but mostly on disability as well. So, I, I was like, really drawn to gender just because of that. And I felt like, you know, this is like the one, like this was it, like, you know, it was very safe for me to join. And um, yeah, and I learned a lot within these six years about myself and how I actually did <coughs> that. Yeah. So I'll just go ahead. Um, so uh, just a little note on housekeeping. We, as you can see, those are, that's our old website, which got hijacked by a Japanese hacker. It's, it's yes. Genderjust.org now has Japanese instructions on how to love So we recovered, we somehow managed to recover our old website. And yes, you're right, it is very ugly. But <laughs> the point, um, we've been very fortunate that one of our members is, anyway, put us in touch with, uh, with uh, DePaul's service learning component, and so in essence, there's a, there's a website design class, which is actually a website and ethnography design class, that is redoing our entire website. This is the old, ugly one, but it does, it does have a few images. I just want to let you know, however, two of the uh, members of, that, of the committee that's redesigning really, really our website, Katie and Arthi, are here, so they might be circulating around you afterwards just to ask you questions about your responses and so on. Um, in terms of gender just uh, history and what we're here for, you know, the short version is we're here to smash capitalism. Right. So that's <laughs> the 10 second version, that's what we would say to you. Uh, but so what does that mean? What does it mean to think about 
capitalism and neoliberalism in particular, which is what the framework that we all existed, right? So as we see it, the gender just sees it, we live in an intensely privatized period of time. The thing that attracted me most to get back to that original statement that I made about gender just is that in around 2009 or, or so, there's a campaign in Chicago as uh, spearheaded by many of the gay lesbian organizations here to begin to found a gay high school, a gay lesbian high school. There's one in New York City called the Harlem Milk High School. So the idea was that you know, Chicago's uh, queer students are uh, constantly suffering all kinds of brutality. They need a quote unquote safe space. Uh, and we need to construct this high school, or at least you know, they were going to uh, place a high school in what's called Sojo High School, I think it would be actually named, but it's kind of a charter ish. Uh, high school on the southwest side. Um, the idea was that this would become exclusively sort of gay and lesbian high school. What what impressed me about gender justice is that it was the only group, the only queer group that refused um, to sign on to that agenda. And I was actually very critical of it. And, here, and the, the reasons for that, the gender just said, first of all, every sh Chicago public school student deserves to be safe. <coughs> The vast majority of CPS students face all kinds of brutality and all kinds of vulnerability on all sorts of levels, right? Physical, economic, right? Political. Um, and there is no need, and also to assume that you can sort of separate out, you know, who the BM has been in high school, you know, school mm -hmm. students are is sort of ridiculous. I would also ask them to constantly be iterating the identity in very particular ways. And also, and this was actually the thing that impressed me at the most, is that Jennifer just said quite boldly that. This would mean, because of the location of the school, this would essentially mean that the high school was going to be part and parcel of this kind of charterization of CPS, right? This kind of privatization, the privatized model of Chicago Public Schools. So that was 2009. We know now what has happened, right, to CPS and the way it's been decimated by privatization. So that's what impressed me most, is that you had this queer group which had a very um, uh, which had a very potent critique of the ways in which gay and lesbian agendas, right, fit into a kind of neoliberal privatizing agenda. So that's what impressed me, and um, that's why I eventually joined it. Um, that's also why those of us who have been in various iterations of gender just have stuck to it so resolutely, despite having been buffeted by those very same winds of neoliberalism, which we can talk about a little bit later. But what keeps us going is. Uh, our sense that there is, there needs to be a place on this planet, you know, a conceptual place, a physical, physical spaces of all sorts, yeah, ideological spaces, whatever. There need to be spaces where queer people, yes, have their quote unquote rights affirmed, whatever that means, right? Have their existences affirmed, are not brutalized, are not killed, uh, are not bashed daily, right? There needs to be that kind of space for those kinds of rights, yes. But it also has to be a way to think about what it means to be a quote unquote sexual and gender minority and to be wrapped, right? To be kind of, um, cocoon, not cocoon, but to be kind of surrounded by these economic and political forces, right? And how does, how do those sexual and gender minorities, right? Those queer people, let's just you know, use that term for the sake of um, just for being quick about it. How do queer people function? within capitalism, but right? how does queerness function within capitalism? The historian John D'Amelio, with whom some of you may be familiar, or all of you are familiar, has written, you know, obviously wrote sort of the most amazing essay about this, Capitalism and the Gay Identity in 1986, which is which is just remarkably impressive. But the question has always been, right, for all of us is how does queerness fit into capitalism? How does queerness does it destabilize capitalism, I would argue no, but does it also um, does it, in fact, also become a mobilizing force in capitalism, right? Does it actually perpetuate the neoliberal agenda? And to see how it, the neoliberal agenda is perpetuated by the mainstream gay and lesbian uh, agenda, what I'm going to do very quickly is try to describe what, what we see as the mainstream gay and lesbian agenda, how we separate ourselves from that, uh, and the constant tensions, right, between all of that. So basically, that is, as most of you may be familiar with, you know, the mainstream gay agenda has been dominated by three, what we call sort of the, the high trinity of gay agenda, of the gay agenda, right? Which is um, the, uh, the gay marriage campaign, which is the, the biggest one, the hate crime legislation campaign, and the move to NDADT. All three of these have been hugely successful. 
Yeah, so you could say, well, why don't you go over and die? But, <laughs> it's over. <laughs> I've been wanting a lot of it, you know, a lot of us have been in for all of this to be over with, so that we could continue what we've been doing. So what's wrong with an extreme gay agenda? Well, first of all, gay marriage, and again, you know, we'll keep a lot of this for discussion as well, so forgive me if I just condense everything down, but gay marriage basically argues, in essence it argues that married people deserve the privilege of being able to live or die based on the marital status. And what does that mean? In, in, the, in this very particular to the United States, right? So in the United States, in states like Massachusetts and Illinois, for instance, um, if you are, for instance, your University of Illinois, Chicago, right? A, 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 a government uh, employee or even private employers are doing this, where if you want to keep your partner on healthcare, right? You have to get married. You can no longer have them on just a political civil union or a domestic partnership. You have to get married. So this is this is happening across the board in states that are, as we know, you know rapidly uh, legalizing gay marriage in this country. That's just one instance, one example of the ways in which the gay marriage campaign has shifted from a potentially radical vision of what it meant to be queer in the 90s, right? So you had the AIDS crisis in, in so the late 80s, 90s, um, and what you had were queers mobilizing for universal health care. Nobody remembers that now, right? But queers actually mobilized for universal health care across the board. Uh, that ended in the 90s with the establishment of mainstream gay organizations like Human Rights Campaign, which is the biggest gay organization literally on the planet, which has, which has an operating budget of about 30, 40 million dollars. I know there's a big difference between 30 and 40 million dollars, but you know, for me it's all after a <laughs> <one percent. laughs> um, So it has this massive operating budget that staples, right? Um, so that, what happened in the 90s is you had this kind of Private, you had a depletion of political energy because of the AIDS crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you had the rise of a gay nonprofit, what we would call a gay nonprofit industrial complex, for which, which was mostly domin dominated by wealthier gays and gays and lesbians, for whom the agenda was rather different from, say, universal healthcare, because they could buy their own healthcare. Right? So that's how the shift started to come about in terms of the kind of perhaps more radical or radical-ish agenda that had dominated the gay lesbian movement to what we see today in terms of the mainstream agenda. Hate crimes legislation, um, we are also, besides wanting to smash capitalism, we also see the prisoner industrial complex as part of that. We're also prisoners <coughs> abolitionists, right? Hate crime legislation essentially funnels more people into the prison industrial complex by slapping on sentences by lengthening sentences, and in many cases actually invoking the death penalty as well. Uh, DABT, again, we can discuss it as greater than, but basically we, we don't understand why these are lesbians are so fervent about fighting for US imperialism mm -hmm. across the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, the short, that's the short version of that critique. Uh, so that's the mainstream gay agenda, and what, that, what it's meant has been a kind of a crowing of wealth, right, in the hands of a few. Uh, we can give again more specific examples. What we, uh, yes, I'm paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> so what that means is that um, we we see ourselves departing from the mainstream agenda. We are we see ourselves kind of all constantly thinking about how gay identity and gay identity, as we know, the best example is Hillary Rodham Clinton, right? A few years ago, she gave a big speech about how. Uh, the United States would now make sure that countries that were not in, in adherence to a um, gay rights agenda would in fact be severely punished with economic penalties. What does that mean, right? What does that mean across the board to hurt economically vulnerable countries, for instance, by cutting their funding because they did not, did not follow what the gay rights agenda determines to be the rights of gay and lesbian people? And then that's complicated because there are people being killed, right? in places like Egypt, in places like the United States, and so on. So what we do as gender justice is essentially we contest the mainstream gay agenda, but we're also at the same time, and far more importantly, and this is what uh, Julian is going to talk about, far more importantly, we're also about establishing the parameters, right? the vision of a world that is more radical. We have bigger dreams, in other words. So what are those dreams? What are we proposing in contrast to as an alternative to the mainstream gay agenda? Okay, I'm going to speak about a particular event, event that we put on um, in the past year that I think it demonstrates um, not just sort of 
takes those ideas that Yasmin was talking about and gives a concrete example of how, how do you go about transforming the world? One step at a time. <laughs> um, how do you, you know? One so last April we had an event, it was called the Nonprofit Industrial Complex and its Discontents. Um, we called it Should I Stay or Should I Go? <laughs> uh, nonprofits are often the venues for people interested in social justice who are seeking meaningful work, a stable income, um, a welcoming workplace with like minded people. Um, but nonprofits also often work hand in glove with exactly the same coercive institutions and ideas that they are ostensibly challenging. Um, anyone who has worked in a nonprofit has encountered this in one way or another. So, an example um, we're starting with TJ, we're moving towards a um, working on an immigration campaign in the next few months. So, that's mm -hmm. part of my mind. Um, immigration and domestic violence organizations. Um, have been known to push incarceration. So uh, as a way to help um, a woman who is an illegal immigrant, um, she can seek uh, shelter for, she can seek uh, support uh, by claiming that her partner is battering her. And then while that turns, she may be sheltered from deportation, but then that invites him to be put into prison or deported or things of that sort. Uh, so that's an example of, uh, ostensibly a social, social justice movement um, collaborating and assisting with um, the persecution of the people they are ostensibly seeking to serve. Uh, so nonprofits, in addition, are often exploitative of their own staff and do not recognize that the importance of equity in labor practices is an important part of social justice. So the line is, well, we, are, we can't afford to pay you more because you know, this is all morally uplifting. Um, conversely, if you look at the HR, H, human rights campaign, I can't say HRC apparently, uh, there's also this argument that the head of the HRC ought to be paid at the same uh, equivalent rate as someone in the private sector leading an organization with a similar budget. But if you were to go to the H HRC, that uh, and want to get involved, they would be thrilled for your free labor. Um, so there's problematic dynamics within nonprofits. The goal of the conversation wasn't, why the hell are you working for a nonprofit? Um, but rather, um, you know, not that they shouldn't exist, because they exist. It's like capitalism, they exist. You can't, if you're anti-capitalist, you can't just decide that you're not going to buy your groceries anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Come by the groceries for me. Uh, but to open up a conversation around the good and bad elements of nonprofits to empower both the staff and the communities that they seek to serve uh, to create real sustainable change uh, and to recognize the complexity of ways that change happens. Uh, so we met in a room, we had a conversation, it was attended by uh, people involved in a large number of nonprofit organizations of various sorts. Um, what were the results of this? What were the outcome? Um, first of all, for GJ ourselves, we used to be a nonprofit. We have decided that we are not a nonprofit organization anymore, um, in part due to problematic elements of um, nonprofits. Um, if you seek funding, then you must be beholden to the interests of the funders and held accountable in certain ways that will limit your freedom. Um, once money starts happening, opportunities for embezzlement arise. Uh, GJ has had different issues with that in terms of our own organization with the misappropriation of funds. Um, so in terms of our own conversations about what we're doing and how we go about doing it, does the full maturation of an organization include seeking nonprofit status so that people can give us money to do the work we do. Um, we are a group of um, many members of GJ don't make a lot of money. Um, when GJ gets given money, we spend it on buying people bus passes. We spend it on buying people food to eat. Uh, but so there, a case can be made that it would be useful for us to be able to access funds um, on a very real level. Uh, but the decision not to become a nonprofit 
enables us to work um, in more radical ways. Uh, so it helped us with our conversation about who we are as an organization. Um, but the feedback that we got from participants is the ideas, um, the recognition of the complexity, they take that back to their organizations. Um, there was, I can't remember the name of the group, there was one nonprofit that three of them came together. Um, and then they go back and they have a, they're able to have a conversation um, with their coworkers, um, with their organization, that shapes sort of what they're about and how they go about doing it. Because many people who are working in nonprofits sincerely would like um, to transform society and are very aware of the shortcomings and difficulties and to think about, to have a space to talk about that um, with others and then take it back to, the, to their own organizations. And I think that that's very much um, the thing that gender justice is interested in is not just in terms of our own critique and our own perspectives, emphasizing complexity of issues, intersectionality, um, but to also um, elevate other voices that are having the same conversations by um, joining in on particular at particular moments um, and either cultivating a conversation or simply um, supporting and affirming a conversation that is already happening. Sort of where we are, right? And we can provide this space precisely because we don't, we're not a nonprofit. So that's the word up. <laughs> yes. We have time for questions. Yes. Which one that was? <laughs> um, I have a couple questions. I have, one is. How do you, um, with so many members, um, and not necessarily, I'm assuming there's not like a staff, because you're not enough of them. So I'm wondering how, um, what methods you use for organizing amongst members and communicating and mobilizing, um, and also deciding on what you, know, what you want, what issues you want to tackle, what's up next type thing. Um, and then my other question, I'm gonna ask both councils I'm here. <laughs> They both can answer this fine if not. Um, my other is I would imagine that, that some of the critique that might come from the mainstream queer community is that um, gender just is is um, not representing a unified voice from the queer community. So I'm wondering how that uh, potential criticism might be responded to from your experience. Do you want to take the first one? Sure. Um, we operate as a collective, which means we sit down and we have a conversation and we make a decision. Um, we're not very big at all. Um, <laughs> How big did we say in terms of active members? Six, Six to eight at the moment. Um, the largest we've been has been 10 maybe 15. 10 to 15. It's a very small organization, so that facilitates um, collective decision making. Um, there's a lot of space for uh, personal initiative, um, personal contacts in terms of where uh, where we go, what we do. I mean, Karen and I know each other, um, so that plays a role in how we end up here. Um, the campaigns that we get involved in are based on sort of people that we know who are working in organizations and that have affinities. Uh, so there's a certain um, free form, the small size permits a free form movement. Um, we have an email list where we plan things, we meet monthly. Uh, and uh, you know, do short-term and long-term planning. Um, we just had a five-hour, six-hour retreat that was exhausting but very effective. Sort of the okay, here are the people who are deeply committed to this organization and this work. What do? What are we seeking from it? What else needs, uh, needs to be happening for us to get that? Okay, can this happen? And then we move forward. Um, so it's a little uh, because it's small size, we're able to be a little more loose. Um, but that also means that depending on who's involved, will shape how exactly, you know, what, what talents and abilities are available very much drives what we do. You mean in terms of the, you, the critique of, from the mainstream uh, organizations that you don't present a unified voice? I just want to be sure. Right. And I, maybe that's not a critique you no. could have gotten, but I was imagine if it could be if, you know, if the mainstream queer community is, is I see, so we, we, we just, well, I think to sort of look at that, you have to kind of you know, realign the axis, perhaps. What the needs, 
we don't really, I mean, and you know this, but we don't really look for validation from the mainstream as much as, you know, we have, a, so I think this might be where we have to talk about Center on Halstead very briefly in terms of how we deal with the mainstream, quote unquote. So uh, just to give you an example, how we deal with the mainstream, is there's, there's a place here called Center on Halstead, which does not take the MS in the data, the data that the center of Chicago, is that, in, in essence. And again, it receives millions and millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars in, in funding. It claims to do all these social, perform all these social service functions, it, including uh, outreach and social service for trans queer youth, right? Uh, including um, uh, social services for uh, the aging queer population, right? Uh, including homeless uh, issues around homelessness and so on. It claims all of that, but it has been criticized over the last many years. It's now about 10, 12 years old. Uh, it has been criticized for not actually fulfilling any of those obligations. We found out, uh, as, as the community has been articulating for a long time, we found out that they were treating trans youth of color, and most, most of the trans youth of color they deal with are uh, working uh, uh, in, the, in the street, uh, working street trades, they're often sex workers, they're often homeless. What we found out is essentially that they were treating them uh, well, they were treating them very badly. They were even asking them to come to a separate entrance. They were not providing the services. They were not listening to them. There were these processes by which, for instance, if a trans youth of color uh, stole from Whole Foods, heaven forbid, uh, they would actually- Whole Foods is in the same right, building. Right, it's in the same building. They share, they share the building. They made, that was the deal that they got to be able to afford rent on that very expensive building. Uh, but they would actually, can call the cops in and make this big show of escorting youth out. Uh, they would call cops on them constantly. So what we did, this, you know, you have mainstream gay organizations. So what we did in good faith, we went to them and we said, we have, first we protested. First we stood outside their doors and we protested. But they let us in and we said, okay, we need to start working with you about not doing this, right? Uh, and these are the ways in which we can help you establish your sort of justice, justice principles, how to, how to be more accountable to youth, and so on and so forth. So we did that for about six to eight months, at which point they turned around to us, after we'd given them a game plan, they turned around to us and they said, yeah, well, you know, we were okay. Uh, you can leave the table now. Uh, and so that sort of been our experience with the mainstream, but what we try to do is we try to work with them. Because we also understand that, for instance, you know, we have a lot of friends at Central Halstead. Again, this is the this is the paradox of the nonprofit world, right? People go in for the best of reasons, and sometimes, what else do you do sometimes with a social, you know, a, a degree in social service or a degree in gender women's studies? Sorry, <laughs> you know, or in English, right? Sometimes, what do you do? You go to the nonprofit world, right? So people are there for the best of reasons, and um, so we try to work with them, and when, when that doesn't happen. But we always make that best, best faith attempt, and then we go ahead and we tell the community this is what has happened. Right? So that's been our sort of way of dealing with the meeting. Now HRC, we just really honestly don't care about it because HRC is just a rapacious, money-making, demonic organization. <laughs> and HRC is in a different realm of its own. It is truly evil. Um, but you know, but that's so our point has never been to simply be the kind of pit bull outside the doors, but to say. We are the pit bull right now because you're not letting us in. Let us in. We, we can talk to you about how to work with people who are actually part of our communities as well. Um, as far as empiricism, you know, either ignore us or if they don't, that's good. I think I want to add one of the things that's very important to me and appealing to me about gender justice. I don't have an identity as an activist. Um, I have an identity as a queer, which means broadly to me that the relationships that are important to me are often considered unconventional in terms of valuing. Uh, and so I'm, the goal is sustainable relationships. The goal is not ideological purity. The goal is talking to the people that you live with, talking to the people that are in your community, whatever that means. And the reality is the people at the center on Halstead that think gender justice is a pain in the ass are also sexual minorities and are also part of my community in that sense. And to keep trying to talk to them in various ways, um, not to spend a lot of energy where it's a waste of time, but to keep talking and recognizing that we are all doing what we can. Um, and I think that that's an important element to say, okay, you know, if you're not interested, you're not interested, but that doesn't mean we're going to shut up and saying that what you're doing is problematic. Um, and, um, the extent, you know, because it's it's not about uh, 
for me, this is not about purity, even though we have a very radical, we want national ideological position. Um, but the reality is that's what can happen next week. So um, what do you do here? Um, and I think that that's in terms of thinking about um, mainstream LGBT responses to um, what we're about. It's a sort of the here, we're, 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 we are happy and interested to dialogue um, and move towards uh, realizing shared goals, but we're going to be very clear when um, you're not recognized, someone, an organization or an individual is not recognizing the complexity of the situation and it's just being on all my certain elements. It's more complicated. We will continue to point that out. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I had two. In terms of funding, because you obviously are a nonprofit and you don't do the whole grant thing, um, what, how do you go about getting funds? Um, is it is it like donations? Do you like fundraise? Like, how, what do you do to do that? Um, and my second question is, um, what sort of like services? <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, no, that's. Uh, and what sort of services do you provide? Because you said you mentioned like when you get funds, you you mentioned bus passes and groceries, but you also do clearly like organizing work and confronting um, other LGBT. Um, organizations. So, like, what is there like a unified sort of services that you provide, or is it what comes around right. is something that you latch onto? I'm just, yeah. In terms of fundraising, uh, we ask for money whenever we speak, for instance. Uh, that's what we do. Right now, we're living off the last of the money that we got a while back. Uh, we're down to a, couple, a few hundred. 170. To be precise. Actually, mm -hmm. yes, I took out my stuff. 70. <laughs> and then I took out my last class. <laughs> 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 we have a little bit more money coming in. Uh, you know, we also said that, we're laughing because we said that, and we said, okay, money's not, I get very panicked, but then I'm one of the, you know, one of the poorest people in the crew, but I get panicked about money, but we also decided money would not work into panic. But anyway, we, yeah, we, we are not deliberately, at this point, we're deliberately not asking for donations because of what happened with the money that we had. We really feel that we first need to establish that we have our housing order, uh, that you know, we're not going to ask for money until we can actually demonstrate to ourselves and everyone, like, okay, you know, this is what happened, this is why it happened, specifically because of the vulnerabilities of the group itself. Uh, but we won't ask for money until we sh we're sure we can do so ethically, in other words, right? So we, yeah, donations would help. Uh, uh, take getting us to speak at various events help. Uh, we hope for mysterious donors, um, kind donors to step in at some point. Uh, we've, even taken, we've even taken down a PayPal, again, because of the ethical issue that we had. Uh, so yeah, that's how we uh, you know, get money. Uh, and in terms of services, we don't provide services per se. Now the food issue and bus passes, because that was always our sort of a founding point for us, right? That what matters most, especially in a city like Chicago, right? Where getting around is so difficult. What matters most is that those of our, in our community who cannot afford to, for instance, take the bus trip or make it across town for whatever reason and will be losing valuable time, they need to have a way to get there and they need to be fed when they get there. So we're very particular about feeding people at our meeting. That's just, that's just one of our principles. Uh, so that's what we spend our money on. Services, what we do provide, we're making this explicit in our new, on our new website, is a kind of, the shorthand would be how to train for the revolution, right? And that simply means things like, okay, so how do we make, how do we do presentations? How do we organize? What does it mean to organize a campaign? I began as a, I do identify as an activist, and I began as one in 1999, I think. And it began from the ground up for me, right? How who do you call? You need to talk about police passes, or you know, police permits, and who who's the editor of such and such place? How do you establish a communication network? How do you write a press release, right? How do you whom do you how do you find out whom to talk to at the center of Hosset? Do you know you know, there are these basic uh, sort of organizing principles you can only learn once you actually do the organizing. So what we at Gender Just are also committed to is whenever we have a campaign, for instance, we make sure that there's one new person who has a chance to be part of the organizing team, for instance. Right? So because all of us have different levels of experience. So 
we could sort of, you know, the, the word is training, right? How do we provide that kind of training for the revolution as it were? So that's the kind of good of service, yes, that we can provide. And we're very particular and committed to. So that's going to be the last one. I just want to congratulate you guys because you know, I think it's, uh, it takes a lot of courage to do what you guys are doing and to be um, you know, radical in today's day and age, I think, particularly. I mean, if, you, if you believe what seems to be most environmental scientists, we've got a generation or two left to save the world, right? You know, right. Uh, there's very little time left, and, right. and, uh, and so I think that um, uh, you know, it's, it's really important to have voices like yours and, and to to be, I mean, it's very easy as well in our society to just kind of, you know, fall into a convenient and, and, and you know, self-protecting uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, cozy space to be, you know, and not kind of take the road less, less traveled. So um, I think this is what we need in order to, to have, you know, kind of lights of hope in, in a society where so many just, you know, fall in line with, with the, with the kind of one with the grain. So. Well, that wasn't really a question, so I guess we have time for one more. <laughs> Unless you want us to respond to that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate that. We're always sort of I'm also sort of shocked when we hear it because we're not used to it so much. But yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and you know, we, we're around. We can also talk about our other campaigns. We did older campaigns with around uh, Chicago Public Schools. We're happy to talk about those uh, in terms of organizing and so on. Oh, uh, I have a piece of paper. If you would like to give me an email address yeah. so that you could get information about events that we put on or things like that, um, it's not a formal type of piece of paper. Uh, but with the website redesign, one of the things that we're working on is being a little more visible so that people who are interested can hear what we're doing. Uh, and uh, you know, if they're interested, come along to the event, or at least just sort of be aware of what's going on. Because um, the conversation that we were happening, having was that um, Chicago has a lot of interesting activism going on, and it doesn't necessarily get onto people's radars. Uh, and one of the things that we want to be able to do is to help people find out what's going on. Yeah, the Midwest really matters. You know, the Midwest matters. The Midwest has always mattered in terms of radical organizing, radical left organizing. And especially in terms of queer history, we tend to get sidelined. So what, that's also what we're hoping our website will do, is to document queer radical Midwestern history. Yeah. So I suppose that's our closing. Thank you all. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.